a technical engineer and instructor at Terrapin Technology. And with me is the wonderful Betty Nelson. Who's wearing green. And Joe is essentially not wearing green. So I'm sending Well, I have a green logo. A green you know, logo. I, I think that's like green eyes. But happy <laughs> St. Patrick's Day to everyone. <laughs> Sending Joe a virtual pinch. But yes, there welcome. We go. <laughs> welcome to Webinar Wednesday. And uh, we're happy to have you with us. I'm Betty, and I am the Practice Support Coordinator at Terrapin. And we're very happy to have you with us today. We have a great subject that Betty has diligently prepared for us today. It uh, has a lot of expertise in, and that is how courts are working and how it affects you and your practice. Uh, and we're looking forward to giving you the research that we have put together. I should say Betty has really uh, outdid herself on what she has to, to share with you today. I'm going to go ahead and just turn off my video again so you're not distracted by our charming good looks. <laughs> And we'll go ahead and get started. So, you know, maybe it's it's just me, but it it does seem like one of the hardest hit industries that we've been working with has been the practice of law and how courts function. Wouldn't you agree, Betty? Oh, I completely agree. Um, I don't think it's just because we work in this area. We have many clients that aren't related to practicing law, but I... Uh, and their businesses are pretty much uh, moving forward. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can see that it's in the news quite a bit. And what's been so interesting is that it's ever changing. So what they were doing a year ago, obviously is not uh, what the courts are doing now. And uh, there's just a lot going on. If you look at the next slide, you know, we've learned now that people appear uh, <laughs> <laughs> attorneys appear, witnesses appear at remote hearings. Um, you know, we've all heard about the cat video. And then I heard about the surgeon that appeared while he was in surgery. I didn't realize it was a Sacramento plastic surgeon. So everybody take note, you know, if, you, if you're thinking about plastic surgery, you might want to skip this guy. Um, but yeah, there is a lot going on. Let's go ahead and... Um, Take Joe, you know a lot about this. This is kind of your area that you've been focused on. Yeah, this is this is something that was very interesting that has come up. I obviously know that the courts have been involved in the the virtual hearings, and there's all these different technologies around to to do this. And lo and behold, if Microsoft didn't jump in with a solution right away. And that, that's exactly what what happened. Um, and this is a change that's likely going to stick around. It is. Uh, Microsoft, yeah, Microsoft created this, uh, you found this a digital justice with a virtual court hearings. It well, is. Very and interesting. It is interesting. And we don't see it on our side uh, as participants, um, attorneys, witnesses, et cetera, interface with virtual court hearings from Microsoft by using Microsoft Teams. Um, but I truly believe, um, after reaching out to a few of the courts, that virtual hearings for certain matters will pro probably stick around after the pandemic. They're just finding it to be very efficient uh, when they have like small discovery disputes. I know magistrates have said they really prefer using a Zoom meeting where they can see the participants versus what used to be a court call. So I'm imagining this is going to stick around for a while. So what's the first thing to tackle to deal with all the changes that the pandemic has brought to court filings and hearings that you've found? Um, well, I have worked with a few firms already, and um, I just felt so many people were overwhelmed by the changes because the changes just keep coming, and they think they have things figured out, and they know how to handle e-filings for a certain, you know, jurisdiction. And next thing you know, they're changing the rules. So I like to come up with a plan of attack. It's what keeps me sleeping through that 4 a.m. Uh, wake up. If I know I've been helping a couple teams with some big filings and, you know, if we have a plan of attack and we know what we're dealing with, it really helps. When we look at the next slide, you know, my initial urge is to always go to the actual court 
that I'm dealing with, but it's really good for everyone to realize that the state of California now has a newsroom at the state level, and it literally has a link to every single court in California. And Joe will be adding this um, link in the chat area. Um, the California Lawyers Association has done the same thing. And since Joe is in North Carolina, on the next slide, you'll see that in North Carolina, they're doing something similar. So many of these court websites will have a banner at the top discussing COVID-19 issues and the current um, emergency orders and implementations. Right. And I just, if case you guys aren't looking, I, I posted those uh, URLs in the little chat window so that you could easily see what those were if you didn't notice them in the slides that we were uh, talking about. Awesome. Now, this uh, this next slide here, this is a uh, interesting one because this is a screenshot of just one of the pages of implementations of orders at the Sacramento Superior Court in California. So the bottom line here is if you have upcoming hearings or filings, visit the website of the court involved for any new updates. And, and the reason we say that is it's constantly changing, right, Betty? Oh, yeah. You can see just the very top three entries are just a little over a week apart. So, you know, I really think it would be a great idea if you have a litigation group to task one member of your support staff for staying on top of this. Um, you know, it avoids us all running around like an old fashioned saying with like chickens with our heads cut off because there's no need for everyone to be in that heightened panic mode if you have somebody staying on top of this. Um, let's not forget our federal courts also are dealing with this. And we have a slide coming up, which is the Eastern District. And you'll see right there, I've added a green arrow. They're doing the same thing. They have a nice big banner in red. If you click on that, it will also give you the most updated information. So I think the key point to remember from all of this is to give yourself plenty of time to prepare for possible changes. Because as you can see, and just looking at the little bit of information we showed you so far, and even when we would go back and check on these for our presentation, things were changing and being redefined on how they were going to be handled, uh, either because of the different COVID orders or restrictions were eased or uh, put back into place or being updated. You just, it, there's just a lot to keep in mind and to keep up to date with. And Betty, your suggestion about having someone to stay on top of that is really, really um, pointed to, to that situation, to, to stay on top of it. Right, because not only are the courts adjusting, you know, the whole state is adjusting depending on how, the level of an outbreak. So, you know, the, the status of each county changes on a fairly regular basis. Hopefully we're, we're heading toward a much better place. But some of the smaller courts surrounding Sacramento never had e-filing or never had the ability for attorneys um, to access the case files online. And those courts are really struggling. El Dorado County Superior Court comes to mind. They've set up a, a system where you can make an appointment to come in and look at a court file. But you can imagine they're definitely struggling trying to get up to speed with some of this more modern technology that, for example, the Eastern District has been utilizing for a very long time. And the good news is courts like the Eastern District do continue to have tutorials that you can access. So if you have a new member of your team that hasn't done electronic filing with the court, there is information available for them and training online. Very nice. Now, of course, the, the goal of all of this is <laughs> to avoid some type of rejection on your e-filing. Yeah. And Betty, I know, I know clients have reached out to us for assistance with e-filing. What are some of the situations that you have seen that have come up uh, with regards to e-filing and what they're requesting or having problems with? Yeah, um, this is actually one of your worst case scenarios. And, and it's so much pressure on the support staff because the attorneys, um, you know, back in the day, the court, you had to have your filing at the to the court, say, by 4 p.m. So you added in the drive time for the court runner. 
you know, they pretty much had to be done by noon so you could photocopy it, get it organized. Unfortunately, now with electronic filing, some of the courts, the deadline means midnight, you know, 11.59 p.m. for that court. So I do know secretaries that literally work into the middle of the night. And unfortunately, with that scenario, when you're pushing it to that very last minute, if you have any filing rejection, there's not a lot you can do. So I still think it's a best practice to not take everything to the last minute. And I also think people really need to gather the information they're learning when they have an e-filing rejection. I've seen situations where, you know, it's almost always a PDF file and for some reason you can't understand why it's being rejected. It looks good, but, you know, PDF files can be complex. Uh, they can have layers. They can have embedded objects. They can have embedded hyperlinks or executable files. So one of the things I've found that really helps firms when they're in this panic is to flatten a PDF. That is a term, flatten, F-L-A-T-T-E-N. And you can look it up. But I have a, created a JavaScript um, that allows me to flatten files and pauses in between the files. So I can do a whole folder at once, but I can pause between each incident and look at the file briefly for any other issue. Um, we just uh, recently helped with a big Ninth Circuit filing for one of our clients. And the filing was on a Friday and I resisted all urge to reach out and find out how things went till Monday morning and I heard everything went great. So that would be one of my big pieces of advice. You will also come into situations where your attorney insists on including a document as an exhibit and that document is only available on the internet. Even if you download the file, security on that PDF file is set to not print, not copy, not edit in any way, shape, or form. And, you know, clients reach out to me in that scenario as well. And then I use various software to capture those images, put it together as a PDF OCR so it's text recognizable because courts notoriously hate scan documents. So we kind of fake them out with that two-part process. And I just wanted to mention when you flatten a file, it does not remove your text layer. It's still a searchable PDF, which is really what most of the courts want. Right, exactly. So I mean, that's a lot of information. And you even dropped a little bit of your uh, techno skills there with the JavaScripting. <laughs> Good job. But if you were to recommend a first step for a uh, you know, large or small firm, anyone who's going to be doing uh, e-filing or uh, working in this with, you know, kind of putting together a toolbox, what would you recommend to do first? Exactly the, that term. I'm a big fan of creating an e-filing toolbox. Putting together, you know, first I like to make a document. Um, I Every time there's an e-filing that I'm involved in, I go to the court website, I take some screenshots, I copy the text, I make sure to look into their frequently asked questions about filing rejections and what to check for their court. Every court will tell you something different because every court or jurisdiction is requesting something different from you. For example, the California Public Utilities Commission wants you to file PDF A files. And that is another special specification for PDF files, the A standing for archive. Um, so you really have to get familiar with these different courts. So start with a document listing their requirements and start putting together a tool a box. I think you should have more than one PDF handler. Um, Adobe DC Pro is sometimes considered the gold standard, but I've actually seen it do a poor job at reducing the file size. And then I've used another product like a PDF docs from Docs Corp, and that did a wonderful job reducing the file size. So having more than one tool available is really handy. Um, nice. And that's, uh, you that's know, because I didn't even, start. yeah, that's yeah, I, I didn't even think about that. That's that's interesting. You mentioned that. So I mean, because typically most people are just going to have just one tool to do this. Um, so having multiple tools in your toolbox to help in the case where one doesn't do a good enough job. And it, that's, yeah, a good, it, that's a good little tip. 
It doesn't have to be a software you put on everyone's desktop. Again, if you have this litigation team and you have a couple people that are always involved in e-filing, get a copy, you know, of PDF docs for them, or there are other, um, other PDF tools uh, that are available, but try them out, you know, take one of those PDF files that gave you a lot of grief and use that always as your sample. Can you accomplish your goal? Again, file size is a big requirement. They want, um, a lot of courts want it to be under 100 megabytes. So you're combining files, you know, and you might have exhibit A through K. You're trying to make it so you're not, I've seen firms go up to double Z. They have that many exhibits to a filing all the way through the alphabet twice. But that doesn't mean you want to attach all those files. You try to combine some. And so you need a pretty robust tool where you can add in slip sheets and market exhibit A, exhibit B, or whatever your, your format is for exhibits. And, um, you know, this is not stuff you should be learning during the time of filing. You want to have this group, this team that's going to be doing this feeling really comfortable. And we're available to help and train them or just discuss what their specific needs are and make sure they have what they need. Which is why we're very happy to have Betty on our team to answer all those questions. Because <laughs> you can see there's just a there, lot done, to know. Yeah, I mean, you know, I had 20 years as a litigation legal secretary, even though it feels many years ago, a lot of those uh, events are still fresh in my mind. <laughs> Right. That, that's because Betty started when she was like 10 years old. That's, uh, <laughs> now, even if you are organized and have everything in order, things can still go wrong. So <laughs> what would you recommend that or what have you seen uh, or that you could recommend that helps to alleviate that type of worry or, you know, what could go wrong? What would you recommend? Well, first of all, um, back to what I mentioned earlier, allowing enough time, you really need to add in some time for the unexpected. I mean, think about it. People aren't working in the office necessarily. So there's, you know, it's, you add that level of stress in. I, number one, give yourself more time to deal with the unexpected. Have more than one person on your team available and ready and familiar with everything you're doing. You know, they shouldn't be asking, where can I find this? They should, you should have all the exhibits organized on your desktop. You shouldn't be pulling anything from your document management system. You know, start with the, the best possible scenario. Um, and once you've allowed enough time, then you can reach out to someone to assist you, whether it's Terrapin, which we get those calls and we get looped mm -hmm. in. Um, the other thing is, um, going to the next slide, there are options for you. Um, have, yeah, so yeah. There, there, are, there are filing services that, uh, that do just that. They help with the e-filing roles to assist with the e-filing if your firm doesn't have the tools uh, necessary to accomplish uh, that task. So it, we've we've helped others to to find that if they needed that assistance. So if you need something in that regard, let us know, and we could obviously help you uh, get information about filing services in your area to help you out, so that yeah. you're not not having those rejections. That's ultimately the 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 whole end goal is not to have those things rejected oh, because of that course. just puts I mean, a whole and, speed and, bump the whole thing. And that's the problem of waiting to the last minute, you know. Um, then what? What if you're dealing with a statute of limitations or that is your very last day to file and serve and it can't get filed? Internet right. um, issues come up. But a filing service, you know, that's really their job. Just like Terrapin's job is to assist you with technology, a filing service is there to assist you with e-filing. And they're very familiar with the issues. They also often have tools I've been involved in situations where they're, you know, they're reaching out to me on behalf of a client and, um, it, you know, maybe you just don't have enough manpower or you don't want to put together a group that has this level of expertise. If you, you know, want to use a filing service, it alleviates a lot of stress. So that's it does. definitely an option for you. And then of course, not least, not the least a bit, uh, effective here is, Betty has put together a nice little list for you. And so here you are. Yeah, this is really just what I would do if I was working on this project. 
get all your exhibits together as soon as possible. You know, the other thing that can create a lot of stress right before filing is a table of authorities and table of contents. If your pleading is long enough to require those, uh, there's been so many changes lately in how we accomplish those tasks. Most firms used to have best authority um, by Levitt and James, and now that's been purchased by Latera. If you had Latera, you they had its own program, uh, Citationware, which they've retired. And now, starting with these most recent renewals with Latera, they will tell you you cannot renew best authority as well. So again, if your firm works in litigation and you're using best authority, reach out to a Latera right away. They're now packaging uh, their tool in what's called a litigation companion, and it's licensed different and the cost is different. So I'm just bringing that up. Um, you know, check back to my list because I thought of that yeah. today because it just came up. I know that's not on my list, but this just came up this morning. So I wanted to add that in. But check Add the updates. no software surprises to the checklist. No software surprises. <laughs> you know, get those exhibits organized. That is a huge part of this. Um, I'm Most people are filing hundreds of exhibits on big, big cases. So it's a lot to do. And I mentioned most of this earlier. Leave time. Have an e-filing service available. Get ready to... Upload your documents, meaning have them in a folder on your desktop, not buried somewhere on your network or in your document management system. And just, again, the extra time would be, I can't say it enough. I could say it <laughs> on every line there and I'd be happy. It really is. It really comes down to that quite a bit. So, so Joe, virtual some, hearings. Yeah, Joe's been helping with this. Um, Joe has been regularly teaching Zoom and team classes for some of our law firm clients. And in some situations, he's even been asked to work directly with their law firm clients and expert witnesses. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've learned? Yeah, this is very interesting uh, because uh, we, you know, obviously you're trying to learn this new technology and how it works. And, you know, and everyone has kind of used these things before, like when they were using WebEx or they're using GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar. But suddenly when you're thrown into it to be your primary way of communicating, it it's almost like this all everything that you've learned is kind of thrown out the window, which it's not. It's just in these new little wrappers or programs. The virtual court hearings we talked about from Microsoft that courts are hearing is essentially like a, a commercial version of Microsoft Teams that they're using with different uh, different features and functions available specifically to the courts. Microsoft Teams bundled with uh, Microsoft Office, really, really nice product, uh, primarily because it's not just for web conferencing. You can use it to chat with your team, share files, and this is all while you are not in a conference. But then when you are in a conference, those things are still available. So it's a, a nice encompassing program and product that uh, ties really, really nicely in with Microsoft Office. And then uh, YouTube is being used quite a bit for uh, for courts where uh, I know, Betty, uh, as an example, you have listed here on the slide, uh, the uh, Sacramento Superior Court, they have all of their public hearings via YouTube. So you could go to YouTube and subscribe to them. You could. If you were really bored, you can watch uh, <laughs> like criminal, criminal arraignments, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, so Sacramento Superior Court is using Zoom. And then they are, uh, you know, publishing their hearings out on YouTube and you can subscribe to these different courtrooms. Um, like I said, every court's doing it a little differently. Right. Now, I believe on the U.S. District Court, uh, Eastern District, uh, they're using Zoom and they had a list of recommendations. I'm just going <laughs> to paste that uh, that link in the chat window there. Okay. It's very it's very interesting. It is. You know, some of it is obvious, but then like, you know, we've had the cat filter and we've had the surgeon. We've also had another Sacramento uh, member of the Sacramento community appear at a hearing while he was getting his hair cut in a barber shop. So, you know, the Eastern District's given you uh, what should be obvious, you know, refrain from eating, uh, mute your other devices, but still. Right. Good Don't eat croutons you. while you're in yeah. a hearing. <laughs> 
<laughs> Stay away. No trail mix. <laughs> the crunchy garlic bread. <laughs> exactly. I'm, uh, I'm no slip No slurping of slurpees. I'm just cringing, <laughs> thinking of judges having to ask people to refrain from eating during a hearing. Right. Uh, and trust me, uh, Betty and I have had a good laugh at all the different things that we've read about or uh, possibly imagined because you'll read these uh, you'll read these restrictions or uh, recommendations and you're like, what has prompted them to, <laughs> to, include, to, that. <laughs> to include them? So, you know, for a good laugh, uh, you can look <laughs> through those. And, and, you know, we laugh and it's it's funny, but at the same time, it's, it's like, oh, well, it's not. So. It's not. And and I just want to mention some firms have set up Zoom rooms. You know, I have a friend who's a partner in a firm. They, you know, initially in May of last year, they had cardboard boxes stacked up like a podium. And then she would just set her laptop at the right level. But now they have a Zoom room with lighting and really good microphones. So, you know. I think a lot of firms believe this is going to be the norm for a while. Yeah. Well, and so that's, and again, here we go. We got our checklist for you. <laughs> and it, this, this kind of goes along with, uh, we were talking about e-filings before. Here we're talking about the virtual hearings. So just be aware of what's going on, what updates there are for your courts, uh, for the districts that you're working in. We've talked about this, uh, this other one many a times and several times in, in our different webinars about just paying attention to your surroundings. You know, it's not just you, but it's also what's your background uh, of your office. Uh, do you need to blur that out? Do you need to change, put up a curtain, uh, you know, paying attention to your, your, your own uh, attire uh, in, in addition to that. Testing your equipment and rehearsing ahead of time can never be done enough. Always be aware of what's going on in case you have to turn off that cat filter. Uh, <laughs> you know how to do that. Uh, and, you know, be aware of other things going on. You know, we're working from home. So I, you know, when, when is my 11 year old going to come in and ask me a math question during one of my webinars? I'm still waiting for that to happen. It's going to happen <laughs> one of these days. Uh, or, you know, his big thing right now is to come in and say, uh, this is Elf. What's your favorite color? <laughs> For anybody who's familiar with that movie. But be a, be aware of what's going on. Uh, you know, the, the privacy that goes on for your different discussions, obviously in the legal arena, arena you want to be uh, sensitive to that in what's going on. Uh, also, what's going on in your house, letting them know that you're going to be doing uh, maybe a virtual hearing or uh, a webinar or whatever it might be so that they don't disturb you. Watch your backlighting. You know, for me, I'm in front of a window. So the natural light's coming in at me versus behind me so that my camera doesn't adjust to the light behind me and make me, make me and my room look so dark. Right. And test those things out ahead of time. Again, it really does come down to preparation and being aware and taking time. Nothing can take uh, nothing can replace taking the time to learn those things and be familiar with them so that you can react very quickly. Uh, and if you do have to react, many times you just go with the flow and it's okay. You're prepared. Yeah. And, and I, then of I course, wanna, I want to add yeah. one more thing before you finalize that, Joe. I can't emphasize enough about practicing if you're going to be sharing exhibits during a hearing. Um, a lot of times, you know, the, the attorneys that are in hearings are, are more senior attorneys with more experience. That can often mean they're the attorneys that don't have a lot of technical expertise um, because they don't want to. So we recently did some training with a firm and the senior attorney who was going to be participating in this bench trial was struggling with showing exhibits. And one of the younger associates offered to kind of play a paralegal role and be the one who's pulling up the documents for him. So yeah. that stuff has to be worked out well in advance. Um, and and I can't say enough point. about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's kind of the case where you have, maybe uh, you are the presenter, but then you have someone helping you do the AV hosting or the media hosting so that you don't have to worry about, you can worry about your presentation and what you're doing. And Betty and I do that frequently where one of us will take care of the media while the other one is doing most of the presenting. And it helps to offset 
the responsibility, and what you're trying to remember. So you can focus more on your discussion. That's a great, that was a great rec- uh, point to bring out, Betty. Okay. Well, as always, you know, we're always around to help answer questions uh, on training or in the technical areas of uh, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, uh, whatever product you might be using to help for training your team. And in this case, many times we've done for expert witnesses, for the attorneys preparing for their uh, their trials, whether that's a bench trial or uh, whatever it might be, we can help with that. You bet. Well, we appreciate all of you being in attendance today. And what uh, we hope that what we were able to bring to mind will remind you, uh, you know, our nice little checklist that Betty has put together on how you can be effective in these areas, because it is a fact that the courts uh, are working they are changing and it does affect us. So whatever we can do to help you be more effective and be prepared, that's our goal so that you can continue your work and have a very high level of professionalism when it comes to your clients. Absolutely. Thank you, Betty, for putting that together. That was very interesting and I I enjoyed that. And we'll look forward to our next topic. This is a really good one. It's going to hit everybody at the belt. (laughs) Uh, We're going to be talking about wrangling emails, how to keep your inbox under control, if that's even possible. (laughs) Uh, Oh, it is. It is. I have lots of ideas. Absolutely. Stay tuned next time for a good laugh on that one where we can see what we can do (laughs) and some, uh, some great stories that we can share with you. Until then, thank you very much for attending and we'll have you next time for our webinar Wednesday. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your week.